This video is our second example on dealing with dummy activities in a project network. To have a look at some more information, have a look at our first video on dummy activities. So what we'll do is we'll create a project network based on this table. We can see in the table that there's only one activity with no predecessors, and that's activity A. So that'll start at the left-hand side of our project network. Building on from that, there's only one activity with a predecessor of A, and that's activity B. So that'll be immediately to the right, and then it adjoins the node after the completion of activity A. We can then see that we've got three activities which have B as a predecessor. So three activities will come off the node at the completion of B, and that's C, D, and E. The next thing to consider is we have a possible conflict with our predecessors for task F and G. F has got predecessors of C and D, and G's got predecessors of D and E. So there's a little bit of a mix going on. So let's have a look first of all at the simple case. In this next diagram, what we're going to do is ignore activity D for the moment, because that's the one that's shared between activity F and G as far as the predecessors go. What we do know is activity F definitely follows on from activity C, and we've indicated that with the arrow at the top of our diagram and activity G definitely follows off from activity E. The question mark is how do we distribute activity D so it's a predecessor for both F and G? Let's just recheck our present diagram. We can see that activity C is definitely a predecessor to activity F. And the same applies for G, that activity E is a predecessor to it. The problem is activity D which basically belongs to both F and G. So what we do is we put a dummy activity in from the end of D, so it splits between the two activities F and G. It must run into the node that's before F and before G because it is a predecessor and neither activity F or G can start until D is completed. Now we can place our remaining activity H at the end of our network because that follows on from F and G and that's quite straightforward because there are two predecessors both leading into task H. H is not a predecessor to any other activity so that's the completion of our network. Let's have a look now at how we determine the critical path and the minimum completion time. At the beginning of the project we'll start at zero days and the next two nodes are quite straightforward as we've only got two numbers to check. In the first case 6 and the next case 6 plus 4 is 10. Moving to the right we need to be mindful of two arrows at two nodes, one of them coming from activity D. So we're going to go to the middle node first. The number there is 19 which is 10 plus 9. There are two values to check at the top node. 19, the maximum time is what we place down to ensure all activities are done. Likewise at the bottom, two values to check, again 19 is the result. So activity D is how we got the value of 19. Moving to the right, we can see that 19 plus 7 is 26, and after G we get 25. So 26 is our best value, and the remaining value is 31 at the completion of our network. We can see that the critical path is A, B, D, F and H and the time it takes is 31 days.